one. Hey everybody, it's Stephanie from The Learning Project. You guys, I am so excited, okay? I'm trying to control myself. I am, whew, I wanna welcome you to our new segment, Sending Strength and Love, you guys. This segment is going to be hot and heavy. I wanna say also, trigger warning. We are going to be talking about miscarriage. We are going to be talking about abortion. We are going to be talking about a very deep part of um, labor, pregnancy, loss. Um, so if this is a podcast that you might not want to listen to right now, or you're not in the right mindset, I want you to make sure that you save this podcast, come back to it when you are ready to listen to it. But I want to give you a little heads up because this is going to be one of my podcasts that is super deep and I want you to be prepared for it. If you know someone that is definitely looking for a story or something that's going to help them um, develop, grow, understand, even heal um, in this area, you guys, this is the podcast for you. Um, I would like to welcome Elizabeth to our podcast. Hello. Hi. Oh man, I just want to say thank you so, 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 so much for being here. This is going to be an amazing podcast, not just because she's amazing, you guys, but the story is going to bring so much healing, so much clarity, and so much knowledge. So, um, Elizabeth, tell us, what is your words of wisdom or even just encouragement to women that are dealing with loss or going through loss and pregnancy? Yeah, I think you need to know more than anything that you are not alone. You are not hearing about loss. You're not hearing about pregnancy loss very often. It's not something that we talk about in the way that we should or at the volume that we should or um, as often as we should. But the reality is that you are not alone. You are one of a great cloud of women who have wanted babies and tried for babies and worked for yeah. babies carried babies and lost those babies and you um, feel isolated and alone and a little taboo and a little bit ashamed and a little bit confused and angry you feel all those things um, but what's true in that big cloud of feelings is that you are not alone and that everything you feel has been felt by millions of other women and everything you feel is okay and I think that that's what women need to know the most when they're thinking about or experiencing pregnancy loss is that this is something that has been happening for a long time and that we are very late to the conversation. Mm. And, and so more than anything, um, my hope in sharing kind of my experience and my, my research and my work is that women would know, would hear, oh, there's someone else who's gone through this and what yeah. I'm experiencing is normal and I'm not crazy and I'm not, there's nothing to feel shame about. Um, that would be what I would tell anybody because you're not alone you've got I love it alone. I love it you guys we are sending so much strength and love right now we are so excited about you Elizabeth coming here and being on this podcast tell us a little Thank bit about you. yourself and um, then we'll jump into the next question yeah so I am a working single mom I have um, I had five children two living my daughters are Sophia and Malia and I have three sons who we'll talk a lot about today um, named Isaac John and Malcolm um, and I I work in academics I'm I'm an entrepreneur I run a foundation and so I, I wear kind of many many hats but the hat I'm wearing today is to kind of is that of mom and survivor. And, um, and I just, am, I'm really excited. Thank you for having me because I think this is a conversation we need to have and there's stories we need to be okay with telling and okay with listening to. And I think um, understanding of in the sense that recognizing that our stories are not always cut and dry. Yeah. They're not always black and white the way that we want them to be. And that sometimes loss takes a hat or a characteristic that we didn't expect. Hmm. Uh, and really that was my experience with my sons was that loss um, did not look the way I thought it would or hmm. did not look the way other people think it should look. Wow. So what's your story? 
Yeah. So my story is pretty, is seemed pretty straightforward until it wasn't. Um, I got married right out of graduate school and about two years in decided we wanted to start a family. Um, it took us about a year to get pregnant and I got pregnant spontaneously with twins right off the bat. Um, and being my first pregnancy, I did not really know what to expect. And so I was incredible, you know, the fact that I was incredibly sick, throughout my pregnancy, I thought was probably kind of normal. Sometimes pregnancy is just really hard. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but at 20 weeks, every, you know, everything seemed to be going fine. I'd gone to my appointments. I was taking all my prenatals. I was doing all the things. Um, went in for my 20 week ultrasound, which is the exciting one. This is when you're gonna find out, you know, what you're having, boy or girl. Um, and went in and found out, surprise, it's twins. Um, and we were shocked and surprised and a little bit panicked, like, oh my God, a crib was so expensive and now I need two. like, you know, we just have this panicked moment. Um, and within about an hour, um, of a very long ultrasound and they were kind of trying to measure and see everything, they ended up sending us upstairs to just talk with, uh, our midwife at the time and just kind of in what I thought was renegotiate the plan. All right, well, now that there are two, what does pregnancy look like? What does care look like, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I sat down with, we sat down with our midwife and she told us that one of our babies had already passed away hmm. and that they could see um, some pretty serious problems with the baby who was living. Um, and it was literally like, the highest high to the lowest low within 30 minutes. We just mm. were stunned, surprised, shocked, um, very confused because they weren't able to tell us much about what was going on with our living baby at the time. Yeah. So um, I was living in Seattle at the time. So they sent us from the normal hospital over to University of Washington Medical Center where mm -hmm. they sent really complex cases. Um, and we went through about a week of tests and interviews and genetic testing and ultrasounds and all the things. And I, we sat down kind of, once we'd gone through it all, we sat down with our perinatologist who is a high risk OB. Mm -hmm. And I, I was telling you my most vivid memory of that meeting, um, was that she pulled the Kleenex box away and handed me a hand towel instead. Um, and I remember thinking, oh my, oh boy, this isn't good because I'm not going to cry for a Kleenex. I'm going to need a towel. Yeah. Um, Can I just put some yeah. pin in that real quick? Yeah. What you just said, that statement is so powerful. Mm. Like the tissues are not going to do it. The towel, I need a towel. Yeah. This is going to be something that is going to change my life forever. It's going to yeah. pierce my soul. Yeah. When she gave you that towel, what literally went through your mind like what was it my stomach just my heart just kind of dropped into my stomach because mm. my I went into pregnancy having very clear beliefs around life and babies and pregnancy I believed God, God made life um, and that my job was to be a caretaker of that life and to preserve that life at all costs and to protect that life. Um, and all I felt coming at me was a wave of complete lack of control. Hmm. Something is happening inside my body that I don't know about, that I can't control, I had two babies and I didn't know I had two babies. I had a life that I loved and wanted die in my body before mm -hmm. I even knew that he was there. Wow. Um, and it was really overwhelming. And when she, you know, we had gone through all these appointments. We had tons of people praying for us, lots of thoughts, lots of prayers, lots of reminders. Hey, no matter how disabled your baby is, you've got a community or, you know, we yeah. knew it was the problem, but we, we, I never would have thought a terminal problem. The plan was how do we find, get enough information to just cope with whatever's coming to us. Right. So when she handed me a towel, I thought, oh boy, it's bad it's bad. Mm -hmm. Whatever's happening in my body is bad. Yeah. I need to be ready. Um, wow. Yeah. Um, 
our doctor at the time, um, what uh, every doctor I have encountered in my, in my journey has been incredibly supportive and helpful. Um, and this was my first experience of a doctor giving a lot of space for me to be autonomous and to have control within a situation. I didn't think I would have much control in, but mm-hmm. our doctor basically laid out for us what they saw with our living baby, which was, um, a lot of problems. They could not find his stomach, even with some of the most advanced ultrasounding that exists wow they could see that his brain was flooded with fluid they could see that he had um, contractured limbs which means the limbs feet and and arms were locked into the body arms and fingers were yeah locked Um, he had clubbed feet they couldn't tell either baby's gender at the time but we found out later it was a boy Um, and they they basically laid out his current state for us and affirmed to us over and over and over that their desire was to help me stay pregnant as long as I wanted to stay pregnant. Hmm. Um, They laid out the risks involved with that. I was carrying a dead baby. I had been carrying a dead baby he was measuring around 17 weeks and this was around 20 weeks. So I'd been carrying a dead baby for almost a month. There were risks involved with that related to sepsis, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Um, And I left with a lot of phone numbers and with this load of information that seemed completely contrary to my ethic, my, who I was, you know, Um, and I got in the car, we were driving back over the 520 bridge. And um, I remember just looking at Joseph, who was, you know, my, my husband at the time and saying, I don't, I don't, I just kept stuttering. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I I don't know. I, I, uh, you know, um, and we had the conversation. I will never forget it. He asked me, you know, he went quiet for a little while. And then he asked me, he said, what would you want me to do if you got in a terrible car accident and you were on life support and you could not live on your own? Hmm. And I said, I would want you to let me go. Yeah. I I don't want to live like that. And, And he, he just looked at me and said, why, why would you do less for our baby? And that in a minute changed my life because I, it changed the conversation from, do I have to die trying to keep this baby alive who can't live beyond Mm -hmm. my body? Is it, is, is what's right for me to die? in this is this what this is all coming to wow and it changed the conversation from that to how do I offer this baby I love and I want the most respect and love and dignity how do I as a mom take the blow Hmm. so that my baby doesn't have to how do I save my baby from that and the answer was so contradictory to what I thought the answer would be the answer was I let my baby go and for me, in my situation, that was a second, what was legally labeled as a second trimester late term abortion. Hmm. Because the answer was for me to induce labor, knowing that my baby would not live and let him pass. Wow. Um, can I, can I yeah. stop you right there? Yeah. Um, because there, first of all, thank you so much for sharing this. Yeah. Like, I, I keep saying this because there's so many people that are having this conversation about abortion. And I just learned this, you guys. So as I was going through this segment, this this conversation of miscarriage and abortion kept coming up. And I was like, what is this? Like, I have never heard of this in my entire life. And, you know, a lot of people right now, especially with the election, everything going on, a lot of people are like, I am against abortion. I am am pro-life. I'm, you know, doing all this stuff. But the thing that got my attention was you are literally having to have a, you have to have this baby out of your body so that you can live. Yeah. You've already gone through the trauma of losing your baby. Now you're having the trauma of labeling this situation Mm -hmm. that has so many negative connotations to it that for some people, it literally overtakes them. It makes them literally lose their minds. So, you know, when you 
made the decision um, to, to have this late term abortion, what did it do to your faith? What did it do to your relationship with God? And what does it do to your relationship with your husband at that time? Oh boy. Um, it's really strange when the most pro-life thing you can do is have an abortion, right? That's, that's, that'll kick you in the face. Um, I, what did it do to my relationship with God? It basically took everything that I thought was very black and white. And I realized it's not that life Mm -hmm. is so much more nuanced than I thought it was. And that I, you know, for me, life being black and white kept things very simple. It just kept things predictable and controlled, Hmm. which is how I like it. I like to be in control. Me too. (laughs) Yeah. And what do I do when something is happening in my body that is outside of my control? And what do I do with the fact that, like I said, the most, the most pro-life, the most honoring to my son's life thing to do is to, is to pull the plug, is to say that asking you to live longer just to appease my moral code is cruel to you and good mothers are not cruel to their children no good mothers protect their children from pain and are willing to take the pain themselves I think I understood what Jesus did for me on the cross better Hmm. than I did before because if I if I read that as Jesus saying look I don't want you to suffer. I don't want you to be in pain. I'll take the blow. Hmm. I understood that kind of love better. Having, having to take the blow. I took the shame of abortion. I took the pain of delivery. I took that rather than making my son be born and suffocate on a table or be starved to death. Right. I just would have rather gone through that. And I think there was something in me that understood that, that kind of love a little bit better. And I'm not sure I told you this earlier, but I remember it was a couple of weeks after I gave birth and the birth was traumatic and, and, and long and really complicated. Um, but I remember a couple of weeks later, I was home late one night, Joseph had gone to play basketball. He needed to blow off steam. And I was sitting on my couch, just sobbing and sobbing. And I just remember being like, God, what the, you know, like, are you kidding? What did I ever do to you? You know? Yeah. I'm in so much pain. This is so hard. This is so complicated. I feel so much shame because at the time, nobody knew that what I had, what I had chosen, I had told everybody that what I had experienced was a stillbirth because that's how I was experiencing it. And because I was not ready to face the backlash or the questions or the judgment of people who were like, you did what? We are proving mm. that's not what Christians do. I was not ready to lose my job. I taught at a Christian university. I was not ready to face the backlash from my family. So I just kind of labeled it as a stillbirth, which was how I experienced it, but yeah. was not the legal classification. Um, so I was kind of holding all this shame within and just grieving the loss of my sons and all I felt in that moment sitting on my couch you know as much as you can hear God I remember just sensing the voice of God saying I know I watched my son die too this is Hmm. this is painful I know and I remember being like that's what it means for God to be acquainted with our grief, right? That's what Isaiah prophesied about Jesus, that he would be a man of sorrows acquainted with our grief. And that moment for me was like, Oh, you've met this before. I'm not alone. Even if no other woman is talking about this, like no one else has done this. um, God watched his son die too. And that really brought some interesting camaraderie to me and God where I thought, okay, you know, like, you know, you've done this, you've done this uh-huh. before. Um, but it took me a couple of years to be really forthright with what my experience actually was, um, which was a late term abortion. And it took a lot of reading and a lot of just wrestling with this notion of how do I, as someone who believes that God created life, who values life, who right. believes that God makes these babies and that these, you know, how do I balance those things with the fact that I'm also pro-choice and I recognize that this situation is complex and really hard to navigate I think I only really kind of came to that space 
um, my second bout with the situation, I had, you know, my twins, uh, Isaac and John, we did an autopsy for them. We found out that what caused the complication was something called twin to twin transfusion syndrome, which can be really common with identical twins. Um, we got a lot of reassurance that, look, it's really unlikely to get pregnant with identicals in the first place. So it's really unlikely you're going to experience this. If you want to have more babies, you should absolutely feel free to do that. Yeah. So we did, we had an, a daughter, uh, a, another little girl about a, a little over a year later. Her name is Sophia, she's nine now and she's awesome. And then um, when she was about two, we said, let's try again. You know, let's, I wanted to be done having babies by 30. That was the goal, uh, it did not happen, but that was the goal. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I got pregnant again and, um, and made it through the first trimester. So I thought, hey, I'm in the clear, this is awesome. Baby number two. Um, well, I guess in technicality, he was baby number four, but in my, you know, I was kind of like, all right, two living babies is the goal. My doctor was so gracious to me. The minute I get pregnant, she's like, yes, we will do an ultrasound so that, you know, you're not having twins so that you don't panic and worry that this yeah. will happen again. Um, but it happened to be that, you know, I was pregnant uh, kind of during cold and flu season and got a good bout of pneumonia that caused a cough that just would not end. Um, but I, I remember I was teaching a graduate class and so got up one night to teach something. And when I stood up, I coughed really hard and all of a sudden felt like a gush. And I thought, mm. that's not good. I was about uh, 15 weeks pregnant at the time. So I got my students busy. I went to the bathroom, realized I was bleeding pretty heavily. And yeah. I called the on-call OB and just said, what do I do? You know, I'm, I'm instantly panicked. And, you know, they asked all the questions. Are you cramping? Are you this? No, I'm not just, it's just, it's just bleeding. And so they said, okay, well, if you start cramping, come in, otherwise let's see you tomorrow. So I went in the next day and everything seemed okay. Uh, heartbeat was strong. Baby was growing everything other than bleeding, which we couldn't figure out what was causing it. Everything seemed okay. Yeah. So the prognosis was, let's just keep an eye. So I came back in about two weeks later, still bleeding. They did another ultrasound and sat down and my OB sat down with me and said, all right, we, we need to talk. Hmm. And I thought, God damn it. Like, I, like not, no, this just was reminiscent yeah, yeah. of someone handing, handing me a towel, you know, we, yeah. just, and I just, um, she said, look, we can tell it's a boy. And I was, so, I remember being so excited. I just had always kind of wanted boys, you know? So I was really excited about that. Um, but she just said, your amniotic fluid is very low. We want it to be at a 10. And right now it's at about a seven. Mm. Um, this causes complications with lung development. Amniotic fluid is how your baby learns how to breathe, for example. Yeah. And we need to keep an eye and I'm going to transfer you over to our high risk unit. I've already called him. He's waiting for you right now. Yeah. We, we know your history. We know what's happened to you. You are, you know, it was a lot of reassurance. And again, it was our goal is to help you stay pregnant for as long as you want to. Yeah. There's this weird misconception that tends to float through the pro-life community that doctors are like eager beavers for abortion, that they just push yes. you with an abortion. Yes. That has not, in all four of my pregnancies, that has not even been reminiscent of my experience at all. Right. Um, I found out later in conversation with my OB that she's like, look, if I could have told you at the time, I know this is going to go downhill. Let's just deliver you and spare you from it. I would have, she said, hmm. but that's not my job. My job is to lay out what's happening and support you in whatever choice you want to make to empower you in a situation that's out of your control to have as much control as you can. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I love that. That's so good. Like, Mm -hmm. What you're talking about, being able to have a connection with your doctor, yeah. have that partnership, that is what it should look like. And I think a lot of times when women do not have that, you don't know what it looks like. I mean, I literally yeah. had just shared with everybody. I literally just found an OB that I absolutely love, yeah. like, but it's taken me for, it's taken me so long. You know, yeah. I've been trying to, you know, try this doctor, try that doctor and when you don't have somebody that you really feel is petitioning for you and is really got your back, that it puts you on edge. It makes you feel uns unsure. It makes you feel unsecure. I mean, it really 
it really puts you in an awkward place, especially when you don't even have support to, right. for someone to say, hey, I've been through this. I know what you need to do. Go here, do yep. this and not have that guidance. Yeah. I also think, and I, this is the part where I feel like um, as a white woman, I have to be really just honest about and, and recognizing that part of the reason I had the experience that I did with my doctors, with the medical community is because I am a white woman. Hmm. And I am believed there's so much data that shows us implicit bias within the medical community. Yeah. But as a white woman, when I say something's wrong with my body, something doesn't feel right. I am taken more seriously than women of color. Yeah. And that is something that we have to own. We have got to say that that is happening. We have to be honest that that is happening. And yes. that the reason I survived what I survived, part of the reason is because the medical community takes me more seriously yeah. than it takes women of color. And, and until we are honest about that, until we say there is implicit bias, there is sometimes unintentional bias and sometimes intentional bias. And until we call that what it is, are honest about it and begin advocating for one another. Use, so for me, that means using my privilege to advocate for the privilege yes. of others to are honest about that. We're not going to make any headway here. And yeah. I just, I just feel like that's something that we have to name that yep. we have to label and we have to be honest about because Absolutely. I did, have, I did have wonderful doctors. I had fantastic experience, um, in the worst situation. I had the best care in the worst situation. Um, so true. Yeah. So true. And like, even before we got on the podcast, I was sharing with Elizabeth, you know, and I think, um, one, there is a podcast by, um, Brittany. Um, she talks about having a, um, miscarriage at six months and, mm -hmm. Her experience, if you listen to her experience and you listen to Elizabeth's experience, it's very different. Right. And I remember I was telling Elizabeth before I got on um, the podcast, you know, there was a time when I had one of my miscarriages. I was in Georgia. I'll never forget. It, it was around mm -hmm. Christmas and I knew something was wrong with my body. Like I had got a slight positive and I was just like, okay, I'm going to go to the doctor and they're going to help me and it's going to be fine. And I get to the, the doctor's office and I tell them like, Hey, I got a site positive. They give me a P test. They're like, you're not pregnant. So I, I typically would have a chemical miscarriages, like usually that's like the yeah. first week where, you know, you basically would lose the baby. And I remember going in my car and just screaming. I mean, like shaking and just about to throw up because yeah. I'm feeling all of this craziness um, having this, this chemical miscarriage. And I just wanted someone to say, Hey, let's go and do some tests to see what's going on. Like, what if it wouldn't have been a miscarriage? What if it would have been something else? Like right. what is wrong with you? What are you feeling and what's going on with you? And I just remember walking out of there and she was just like, you know what, when you get back to Washington, you can just talk to your doctor about it because we're not going to do anything. That was a conversation. And it was so frustrating, you know, and for women that are going through what you're going through, Elizabeth, I feel like it's way more traumatic because yeah. you've had a lot of time to bond with the baby and yeah. for, for people not to take people serious and to listen to what they're saying, it just sends you into a whole nother level of hysteria. Yeah. And then also, you know, I talk a lot about us learning to not trust our bodies. You yeah. know what I mean? And really tell ourselves a story that isn't true, but, mm -hmm. you know, because of what we've gone through and how we have this relationship with our body, we're not in tune yeah. with it. Yeah. It, it really makes a difference in how we're able to navigate situations. Yeah. I think, um, not being believed is such a common female experience, Ooh. regardless of whether we're talking about pregnancy loss or not. The fact that when I say something is wrong or, you know, um, I don't, I feel uncomfortable in this situation. We are taught to be polite, yep, to be respectful, to be kind to others, as opposed to being kind to ourselves. Yes. Do not listen to our intuition as if our intuition is leading us astray because what exactly. matters more is how people experience us and not how we are experiencing the world. Mm. And the reality is that when it comes down to women and their experiences, the, the hardest thing for us to do is learn to believe ourselves and then yes. learn to believe each other. If I would have walked into that ER in Georgia and said, something is wrong with my body. Yep. 
the sad reality is that my skin color lends me privilege. That means I will be believed. I am more likely to believe than you are. Yeah. And it's wrong and it's racist and it's prejudicial and it's implicit and not implicit. And it's all those things. But part of the problem is, is that we aren't just calling it out for what it is. We aren't just being honest about it. We aren't advocating for each other. Absolutely. And, and I have a responsibility to listen to what my intuition is telling me and believe it. And I have a responsibility to listen to what you are telling me and believe your experience and add and work on your behalf. That's mm. sisterhood. That's partnership. That is how we make a difference in this particular area. It is just not lost on me that yeah. I survived two, and I'll finish telling Malcolm's story in a minute, but that I survived two very complicated, life-threatening, late-term abortions. And part of why I survived, it is not lost on me that part of why I survived is because I'm a middle-class, highly educated white woman. Mm. And that Mic drop for y'all. That... I'm sending some, we're sending some strength and love right now. Okay. I don't, that was such a gem. If you guys did not get that gem from Elizabeth, rewind, pick it back up, put it in your pocket and use it for later. Because yeah. what you just said was the truth. You know, when we're talking about, you know, miscarriage and we're talking about loss and we're talking about abortion, you know, I am like mind blown at this process because I'm like, First of all, there's so much that goes into being a woman yes. and a lot of women don't even know these policies. They don't even know the rules that go around our bodies that impact our bodies. There are people making rules and regulations and labeling things in a certain way. And we have no idea. Right. We don't even know what's going on and how it's being right. done. Well, and we don't have any idea because we have called abortion an issue for a really long time. Yes. Abortion has not been called health care for women. It has not been called keeping us alive in many cases. It has not been called what it is. We call it an issue. We debate it on national stages. Most of the time it's debated by men who don't need to have the conversation in the first place. Boom. Right. So the simple reality is that we have taken something that twice has saved my life and we've called it an issue we've called it a holocaust we've called wow. it murder we've called it fill in the blank because there's so much misunderstanding as to what it is how it's used why it's used the way that it's performed how much dignity is and is not associated with it yeah. et cetera, et cetera. we have made it an issue not life right that abortion is anti-life it's not absolutely it's not. absolutely um, it's not yeah it, My, i was just gonna throw in there too you know a lot of our listeners you probably like you know well what about planned parenthood you know her job her goal in creating that was to annihilate the, the black community we're not talking about that we're talking about do you know that a miscarriage or a a, a, a late uh, a, a, ter uh, a late term pregnancy is being labeled as an abortion. Yeah. So we are making laws that are pre preventing that. What is that going to do for women who really need it? Right. And are we going to lose our lives because we're so ignorant of what it actually is and what right. is the, what's what what's what? You know right. what I mean? We get caught up in what other people are saying, but we don't listen to enough experiences to really understand what is happening. Right. And, you know, what happened to you, Elizabeth, it just, it's mind blowing to me, you know, and my heart goes out to you. And I'm just like, I'm thinking about that process and thinking about how you even got through it, you know, and for you, you had lots of support, mm -hmm. but what about the women that don't have any support? Right. They're doing right. this alone. Yeah. You know, it it can break a person down mentally, physically, you know, spiritually. You know, I talk about in my journey of infertility, like I could not even put God in my 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 journey with that because right. every single time I would try to put them together, if there was any loss or anything like that, I would take it so hard because yeah. one, I had never really met anybody else that was going through what I went through and we were able to talk about it. So I felt like the odd man out and exactly what you were talking about earlier, Elizabeth is like, when you were going through this, you were like, I'm 
like there's so much shame yeah and women know we know what's going to bring us shame yeah. and we know what's going to ostracize us because yeah. we're room like that from a yeah. little girls you know yeah. so you know it's just one of those things the story is so powerful you guys if you know someone that needs to hear this send this podcast to them because this is not just healing for your mind, your soul, your spirit. This is helping us get an understanding of yeah. people's stories and people's realities and what they're going through. When we yeah. throw stones at people and we make them feel a certain way, it can break them down to the point it can't be rebuilt up. And that right. is where we need to be as a community. And exactly what you talked about, Elizabeth, we need to be allies with one another and be able to say, I got you, sis. You know, we're going to we're going to make sure that we are doing things that are right for you. Or if you need me, like, what can you do or what? What resources are out there? Um, I really wanted us to touch on this. I didn't want to interrupt your story, but no, so I love it. continue on yeah. with your story. Yeah, well, some of the reality of what we're inv- I feel like we're inviting listen listeners to is just to empathy because I really do believe that most people who are pro life um, are pro life for really beautiful reasons. Absolutely. They want people to live. They want more babies to be born. They want there to be, we, we want to live in a country that values life. So there's no, crit, I don't hold any criticism for that. What I'm inviting listeners to is to recognize that these conversations are complicated and these decisions yes. are complicated. When it came to Malcolm, um, as I mentioned, I stood up, I coughed. I, my, essentially what we learned later is that I coughed so hard. I broke my own water mm. and what that resulted in was a significant infection in my, in the placenta. So it was about a four or five week process of working with my OB in the high risk unit, um, in particular to monitor him and how he was doing and to monitor me and how I was doing, because I was losing significant amount of blood um, daily. I was, I, I had to go home from work multiple times during the day to shower and change. I was losing that much blood. Mm. I, um, and essentially what was happening is that my body in trying to get rid of the infection, because what happened was I coughed so hard that it ripped the placenta away from the wall, created a wound and that wound got infected. And my body in a desire to get rid of the infection was flushing all of the amniotic fluid with it. Um, And so week by week, we started out with about a 95% chance that everything was gonna be fine. The wound would heal, it would stop bleeding, the amniotic fluid would build back up. Yeah. And week after week after week, there was less fluid and more bleeding. And that, that, that wound was just getting bigger. Um, and it turned out, I remember the conversation with my doctor, um, where, you know, we'd been there about four weeks and, um, we started with a 95% chance everything was going to be okay. And he looked at us and said, look, we've got a, maybe a 5% chance that we can rescue this pregnancy. And he's like, we, I just, I'm going to, I just want you to understand your options and where the laws begin to change. I was 19 weeks pregnant having this conversation. So it'd been about four weeks of this. And he began to lay out for me some of my riff, some of my physical situation, which was um, I was very close to needing a blood transfusion. If I was to stay pregnant until 24 weeks, I would be admitted to the hospital for consistent blood transfusions. And mostly because if I went into labor, I would bleed out so fast that they wouldn't be able to get me back in time. Um, that they would not let the pregnancy go beyond 32 weeks because of the risk to my body, that they would deliver him no matter what at 32 weeks. And he would be admitted to the NICU and we would do all the things. Um, and he told us again, my experience was not a doctor pushing any kind of agenda. It was simply laying out my, the rules, how this game works. And for him, he said, if you were going to make the decision to induce early, we would need to do it before 24 weeks Mm -hmm. because at 24 weeks, the laws change. There's this strange narrative surrounding late-term abortions that, you know, some people even talk about like post-birth abortions as if that happened. It does. Can we lay out once and for all, nobody is having an abortion after birth. That's Mm -hmm. murder. That's a different conversation. Absolutely. Um, there's this notion that, oh, women, you can be nine months pregnant and then just willy-nilly choose not choose to have an abortion. No, you can't. 
I live wow. in Washington state, which is one of the more liberal states and Washington does not even allow that. The laws change at 24 weeks, the laws change and you have to go through a lot of hoops at that point if you think that there's some reason that you need to induce early. So there's just a lot of misunderstanding about how the medical community interacts with these decisions, how they treat women in these situations yeah. and their options are. Um, but I went home from that appointment at 19 weeks. I, you know, picked up my daughter. I did the dinner and the bath time and the bedtime, put her to bed. And um, Joseph went out. I forgot where he went at the time. But I remember just leaning against my bed and my prayer being God just please don't make me choose. I can't. I've already done this once. I've already had to make a really hard choice once. I feel still so much shame and anguish over it, even though I, I made, I know I made the right decision. There's just still so much, uh, there's just a yeah. lot to it, you know? Yeah. Um, and I just remember praying, like, if you're going to take him, just take him, make it really obvious. Hmm. If you're not, then make that obvious too. Like just hmm. make the choice for me because this yeah. is too, too heavy so for me. much. Yeah. Um, and about a week later, I was again, still teaching, teaching. Cause I teach a lot. Um, but I came home, went to bed about 10 o'clock at night, woke up at about five in the morning with blood everywhere and very mm -hmm. consistent contractions. Yeah. I spent about two hours trying to get the contractions to stop before okay. I woke Joseph up and said, I, I think we need to go and, and yeah. Um, called the doctor, everybody met us there. And the minute that ultrasound touched my belly, I was like, it's, we're done. It's at the end because I could not there. Even I could see there was no amniotic fluid left. Yeah. There was nothing left for him. And so our doctor said, look, the only option is whether we deliver you tonight or tomorrow. Wow. Um, so they did blood tests and all these things to see how I was doing. I was wanting to wait till the next day so that I could be with my OB um, it turned out that the infection was so severe. My white blood cell count was just through the roof and they called kind of panicked, like, oh my God, get back here right now. Um, wow. So we went in at about three o'clock in the afternoon and Malcolm was born about 10 30 at night. Um, we, we, I was put on IV antibiotics immediately. I was, um, very well cared for, um, and I got to spend about four hours holding my baby. And, mm. and again, it's so interesting. The picture of abortion that we are sold hmm. is that it's women who don't want their babies and we just throw them in the trash or we, do, you know, you know, we make vaccines out of aborted beetles, right? We do we, yeah. there's these weird things. Um, they would never picture me holding my tiny baby boy Hmm. who looked just like his big sister, who had kind of been sucking his thumb, who mm. this beautiful baby on my chest for four hours. That's not the picture of late-term abortion no. we are sold. No. But no. that was my experience of late-term abortion was a baby mm. I loved, a baby I prayed for, a baby I wanted, a baby I miss, a baby I have his little beautiful heart-shaped urn that's still on my dresser and mm -hmm. I have a mold of his feet, right? Mm -hmm. That's not what we are sold when we are told about the horrors of the Holocaust of abortion. Yeah. Um, and I just, you know, it took me a few, as I said, it took me a few years to kind of come out with look, yes, my experience of losing my sons, it felt like a stillbirth. It felt like they were taken from me. But what actually happened was, was I made a really hard, I made really hard decisions to not, I chose not to die to try to save babies who couldn't live. Mm. I decided that that, that there, that, that, that was not honoring to them. It was not honoring to the God who made them. It was not honoring to the God who made me. It was not honoring to the God who made my daughter who deserved to have her mother. Um, yeah. and, and I made really, really hard decisions and I no longer feel ashamed of those choices because I, I did what was loving, even though it was hard. Yeah. Even though it was painful. Yeah. And I want us to recognize that when we talk about abortion, whether we're talking about, you know, it's funny, I tell my story and people go, oh, well, we're not talking about you. 
And I want to be like, yes, yes, yes you are. <laughs> Maybe you yeah. don't mean to be lumping me into that group, but yes, you are. Yeah. I recognize that people run to their camps, pro-life, pro-choice. I find myself in this kind of third way where I am pro-choice with a pro-life ethic. In other words, I believe that abortion should be safe, legal, and rare because I recognize that the situations that demand it from a medical perspective are really nuanced and complicated and that the only people with the information to make those decisions are the woman and her doctor. Mm. I recognize that abortions that happen on demand, the ones that happen most frequently in terms of early pregnancies, women who say, I, I am not equipped to have a baby right now, yeah. I recognize that those decisions are not made lightly, that they are complicated and painful, that they yeah. are a result of a society that has made pregnancy shameful, adoption shameful, abortion shameful, our women's bodies are shameful, sex yes. is shameful. All of it is cloaked in shame. What's left for women? What's left after that much shame? Yeah. yeah. It's so much shame and it's a, a million dollar industry. Right. <laughs> Let's make money off of, you know, yes. the things we shame you about. Right. So in my mind, um, do I wrestle with abortion being used as, as birth control? As some people say, yeah, I wrestle with that. I struggle with the ethic of that. But to me, I recognize that I am more effective in reducing the number of those abortions when I look at why women are having them, which yeah. is healthcare, childcare, my job will fire me. I can't afford this. I might die if I get pregnant again. I, I got pregnant from rape. I don't want to pretend that I have any insight into what it feels like to be pregnant from rape. I don't right. know what it's like. Right. I'm not going to judge a woman because I think that God knows how scary it is to be us. I think Absolutely. there's grace for the gray. I think Absolutely. there's mercy for gray things. Yes. And I just think that we are better served and we better serve each other when we recognize nuance and complication and we empower women to have what they need to be healthy and safe. And the reality is that we need abortion in order to be healthy and safe. Abortion is not an issue. Abortion is the lives of women. When, they, when we say abortion is healthcare, it's because it's healthcare hmm. it's because I would not be alive without it. It's wow. because this little human wouldn't exist if I didn't have, I had her, she was my fifth baby. She was super complicated pregnancy, but she wouldn't exist without yeah. what I, with, without what I, what options I had legally and safely without a medical team who supported me and kept me safe, who laid out my options for me. And I just think that, um, we don't often include abortions in discussions around pregnancy loss, but I think yeah, anyway. yeah. Oh. You said this so beautifully, you guys. I, with Elizabeth, you were just like, I'm telling you guys, if you guys are not getting something from this, I need you to watch this and listen to this at a whole different time because this is a different perspective. And I think that's what the issue is. Even with our world today, we need to be able to listen to different perspectives and maybe you don't agree with it. Maybe you're like, you know what? I don't yeah. really agree with that. But yeah. at least you heard a different point of view. So you can really be like, oh my gosh, this could be my daughter. This could be my granddaughter. Right. This right. could be me. Right. And if it's me or my granddaughter, what am I going to do? You know, do yeah. I want to lose my child or do I want to lose my mother or lose my sister right. because of this? Right. Like, it's not a easy conversation. You know, one of the things I kept saying was, why is this labeled abortion? Why is this not labeled something completely different? Why is it not on its own? Why, you know, and I started thinking about brands and I thought I started thinking about numbers and I started thinking about money. You know what I mean? I'm like, when we talk about, you know, infertility, miscarriage, all these different things, that is a big dollar, million, billion dollar biz, uh, business. You know what I mean? They're talking about, it's such on the rise right now. They're going to be talking about so much about the commonality of people having miscarriages and having um, problems with getting pregnant. Um, right. The number of, of people that are dealing with infertility right now, I believe it's like one in four. It's pretty high. Nice. Um, or they'll deal with infertility, should I say, in some period of time in their life. So sometimes people think infertility comes with your first child. Sometimes it comes with your second or third or your fourth. It's, it's, it, it comes very in different spurts for different people. So yeah. 
you know, when we're having these conversations, my challenge to you is to really educate yourself. And Elizabeth, I know we might be jumping a little bit here, but you're writing a book right now. And I want to put that buzz clip in right now. (laughs) Because I think that what you're talking about and and what you've experienced is so there needs to be something for people to connect with and something for people to refer to so can you yeah. tell us a little bit about yeah. what's in your book <laughs> yeah. so I have I published a little bit about my experience mostly as a call and an invitation for women to tell their stories because we don't it's pregnancy loss, abortion, miscarriage, all those things are not things that we talk about a lot. They're uncomfortable, they're taboo, there's again so much shame associated with it. But telling our stories leads to two things. One, it gives us the space for our words to continue pregnancies that our bodies couldn't. Hmm. When we remember out loud, we say names, when we tell stories, uh, you know, for me, my boys live in my words. Everyone is going to remember them because Mm. I talk about them. And that really is something that's important to me. I want space for their lives to matter and to make a difference. Um, And I feel as their mom, the responsibility because they can't make their own lives matter. The only one who can is me. And I want to do that. Um, There's also too the reality that um, supporting women and treating women um, through counseling, through medication, through the medical community, we only have enough data to know how to support these women if we start telling enough stories and we start to see what's common in those stories. Yes. So yes. <laughs> some of what I published has a little bit to do with just inviting women com- like out of silence and into community because this community exists and it, yeah. you are, it's not a community any of us would have chosen for ourselves. Mm, yeah. uh, thank God we can be open arms for one another. Um, and then, so, so I've published a little bit about that. What I'm writing will continue with that. Um, I, I also believe there's this intersection between pregnancy loss and just the challenges that women face in general. There's a lot of new data around how birth can be very traumatic, especially for women who've survived sexual assault, for example, that was very prevalent in my experience. Um, There's data around how we support whole families. There's data around um, the, we touched, touched on this earlier, but the experiences that white women have versus the experiences that women of color have. And I think that is work for white women to do. That is Mm. not work for women of color that they should not have to convince us or educate us or teach us that that is an issue. Mm. That's what we need to do. We need to have those conversations so that we can better use the privilege we have to elevate the voices and the stories of women of color. So um, some of the work I do, uh, a good friend and I just launched a foundation called the Rosemary Foundation for Maternal Care, which is all about making doula care available to women. Doulas work as advocates for pregnant women. They work as birth support and postpartum support. They work in those delivery rooms to help make sure that women are heard and respected and that the experience is respectful and kind and and, um, whatnot. So we're working to make that care more prevalent because it's not currently covered by insurance. All those costs come out of pocket, which means the only women who have access to advocates are maybe the women who don't need them as badly. Mm. want to make that advocacy more available. Um, so I'm working, yeah, I've got a lot of irons in the fire as far as this goes, but I, it's really important to me that we hear one another and that when, you know, I I want people to stop and think before they share memes. Hmm. Um, You know, when you see pictures of aborted babies, I want you to stop for a minute and realize no one's taking pictures of aborted babies. Those Hmm. are stillborn babies. Those pictures Hmm. have been stolen and are being used by people with political agendas. I had a good friend whose baby was stillborn, um, whose picture of her baby got used in an anti-abortion ad and she was devastated. Oh my word. Devastated. Why? Of course she was devastated. We need to be more cognizant of of how we talk about women, that maybe we stop talking about women and let women speak for themselves and listen. That's it. 
And so I want to spearhead that initiative. I want to listen to the experiences of women. I want to tell my story in a way that invites people to just sit with the uncomfortability of the fact that abortion is not a straightforward straightforward discussion and that that's yeah. hard and that case by case decisions are probably the most appropriate and that you can love Jesus and be a person of faith and pro-choice at the same time. They're yeah. not really exclusive situations. So I, yeah, my hope is just to invite more conversation around these nuances and to make space for people's experiences. I want, if you're going to go through what I went through and I hope nobody does, yeah. if someone's going to go through it, I want them to go through it with the same treatment that I had. And so uh, the same supportive community, the same listening, the same medical community who believes what I said. And yeah. I don't want that to be limited by um, socioeconomic status or race or, or religion or education. I want that to be widely available. And that's, that's what we're working on. So we're going to get there someday. <laughs> oh, you are going to get there. You are going to get there. If you guys this is sending so much strength and love, this conversation. It's a very controversial uh, conversation, but let me tell you this. This is a real conversation. Yeah. And I have said this continually, that we need to hear more voices from women that are going through different things because we need to know you are not alone. You're not you are alone. not alone. Um, yeah. Elizabeth, I, I have two questions for you before we wrap up here. How did you get through all of this? Like, I know everybody's probably like, okay, she should not be like with this much power and this much strength. And, you know, like, how did you get through what you went yeah. through? And what do you do on your bad days? Oh, I go to therapy. I do a lot of counseling. I go to counseling once a week. I have for years. Um, it's not that this didn't cost me. You know, mm. I, my, my husband and I have since divorced. Um, there's a lot of data around what happens to marriages post child loss. And for us, that was a, a reality. Yeah. Um, and um, I'm thankful, you know, he, he helped me through a lot of those situations and he and I still, I have a lot of respect for my ex-husband. We get along fine. We have two daughters. We're committed to raising them well. Um, so it, so this, this experience has cost me for sure, but I recognize, um, I can't control the trauma I've experienced. I didn't, this isn't something I chose for myself, hmm. but I can, I have control over making sure, over managing it hmm. just like, um, someone doesn't choose diabetes, but they have the responsibility to manage it. Yeah. Um, my heart and my goal for myself is to not hurt myself or others. And that, that means that, you know, for a long time, I, I was on antidepressants and anti-anxiety medication. I don't have any shame in that either. If that's yeah. what my brain needed to cope, I'm good, you know, yep. um, but, but I do therapy. I also don't hide my experience. <laughs> we suffer because we feel like we can't talk about it. And that means we suffer alone. And I don't want to suffer alone. I um, am really fortunate. Um, I have an amazing, you know, I'm dating an amazing man. I am lo well loved by him. He makes a lot of space for my experience and my past and the things I've gone through. Um, he's, uh, yeah, he's, I could talk about him forever, but he's wonderful. <laughs> and I'm super fortunate to have, to be loved well. Um, but, but I think the two things I do to, to stay healthy or I go to therapy, I talk and I'm, and I just choose not to, um, suffer in silence. I choose to be, I choose to tell my story and I choose to let people feel about my story, what they want. They are allowed to feel disappointed in my choice, or they are allowed to be disapproving of my choice. That is their choice to oh. feel how they want. But that does not have any more power on me because my conscience is clear. Hmm. My conscience before God is clear, before others is clear. I don't, I, I did the best. I feel very sure in saying I did the best I could in really impossible situations. And now my work is to make sure that other women can do the best they can in really impossible situations. 
So therapy, medication, and honesty are how I stay sane. Man, like anybody who's not watching this video, like I'm over here melting because I literally have talked about my experience about very different experiences. You guys, I want to make sure I make that very clear because that is one of my number one things when I'm doing these podcasts is to make sure that people understand that every experience is not relatable. You know what I mean? Um, but they may be in the same category. Yeah. So, you know, um, and so one of the things that I did for so long was hide my infertility. Yeah. Like I literally watched my mother just crumble and fall apart because she knew I was going through it. So like baby showers were hard or when people would yeah. announce they're pregnant, it was hard for her. And it, it like people's reaction, like indirectly, indirectly, intentionally and unintentionally, like built this this protection mechanism around me, you know, I talk about my assistant director literally sitting me down and like, she was like, I need you to tell me why you're going to all these doctor's appointments. Are you dying? Do you have cancer? Wow. And she's like crying because I was hiding it, but I was like, I got to take time off to do this. I got to go do this. I got to, they're like, well, what are you doing? I'm like, it's none of your business. You know, I'm like, keep professional, professional, you know? And then finally, when I decided to open up and tell just like my management team, you know, everybody's just like, Stephanie, let us be here for you. You know what I mean? And it's so hard when you're trying to hide it and you're trying to mask it because you have a certain face or persona. I love being yeah. in control like you. I like, <laughs> I like looking to get like presentable, put together. And there were days that, you know, I would wake up in the morning, I would be a hot mess and I would just put my, put as much makeup I could as possible, get my nice clothes on, go to work, come home and just be a hot mess and destructive yeah. and all kinds of stuff, you know? Yeah. And um, sometimes you just need someone to tell you that you are not your ability to get pregnant or to stay pregnant. There it is. There it is. You are you. You are you made by God worthy of love and belonging, whether you are pregnant or not. Absolutely. Stay pregnant or not, right? I love it. And you just, the more that we, you know, the more that we destigmatize it, especially as women of faith and say, you are not pregnant, you are not only valuable if you can reproduce um and the more we just make space for each other to struggle yeah and just instead of sympathizing which sympathy requires distance that i feel really bad for you that just really yeah you know if we practice empathy this notion of may, maybe i haven't experienced what you have but i can be with you in this experience i can sit with you I can love you. I can tell you that what you're experiencing is so shitty and I can validate that for you. And I, you know, I can be with you in pain. That's what, that's what we need as women is for someone to just say, you are, you, you are not alone. You are not alone. You are loved. You are valued. You are cared for. You are loved and valued and worthy and cared for no matter how many abortions you've had, no matter wow. how many miscarriages you've had, no matter if you don't ever want to be pregnant, there's nothing wrong with you. If you don't want to be a mom, yeah, That's okay, right. It doesn't, there's no, like if we can just make space for people to be valued by us and by God, regardless of how their body works or doesn't that's healing. And the only way we get there is by saying, this is my experience. This is what I'm dealing with. You feel about it, how you want. You're allowed to have your feelings, but I'm not going to give them control over my willingness to tell my story. I'm not going to give you say over what I share, right? We need to do that for each other. You so. guys, I am blown right now. <laughs> that was such a gem because what exactly you said was making space. Mm -hmm. There, it's just right now everything is so there's no room for this there's no room for that there's no you can't talk about this you can't talk about that and if you talk about it then you're on one side or the other side mm -hmm. where is the empathy right so where 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 is it you know there that song where is the love where yeah. is the love yeah. you know totally. <laughs> like, well and it's also okay for you to decide that some people are not safe for you to tell your story I don't discuss this con I don't have this conversation about with everybody. Boys. I don't, I specifically don't have it with my mom and I love mm. my mom. 
Um, she has very specific beliefs. We differ in our beliefs about these things. That's she is allowed to have her beliefs. I'm allowed to have mine. And I just draw a boundary that just says, I'm not going to let your beliefs hurt me. Right? Mm. So just, I just choose not to have the conversation with her and that's okay. Yeah. So it is okay for you to decide who is, who is worthy of your story and who's not. Wow. You are not wow. obligated to share, but you are welcome to share. Hmm. I just think there's a, there's, there's some balance. There's a tightrope there to walk. Absolutely. Absolutely. Elizabeth, before we end this podcast, what's the one last thing that you want our listeners to hear from you? Brene Brown says it so well, you are worthy of love and belonging as you are, who you are, what you've gone through. And I want women who have had abortions and who feel like they can't ever tell anybody to know that you are loved and worthy. You are worthy of belonging. You belong in this community of women and you are accepted and not judged because we recognize that none of us know how scary it is to be you. And there's space for you to feel afraid and to have made decisions for yourself that you felt were best, Um, that there's space for that. And we can let those decisions be what they are. Um, I want women who've had miscarriages or who continue to have miscarriages or who struggle with fertility to hear that your worthiness is not dependent on your ability to get or stay pregnant. You are worthy as you are. You you are the blessing God gave. You know, we hear that scripture that children are a blessing from the Lord and we forget we were the children. We are the blessing from the Lord, right? You are the blessing from the Lord. And I do... um, I want, you know, for those who are saying, I'm tired, I don't want to go on this journey anymore. That's okay. And for those of you who are like, hey, I'm going to go for round 27 of IVF or IUI. You go, girl. We're with you. We've got your back. Like whatever whatever you are on the journey is okay. And um, women who don't want to have babies, that's okay. You're not weird. Women who want to adopt, that's okay. You're not weird. You know, like I want women to hear You are worthy of love and belonging, regardless of what motherhood does or doesn't look like for you, regardless of what pregnancy does or doesn't look like for you, regardless of how you feel about these issues or not, you're still worthy. And I want there to be, I just want women to hear there's so much space for you and your experience and your story and um, that you don't need to hide because there's space for you. That's what I would say. If you, you guys, we're sending strength and love to you this yeah. evening or this morning or this afternoon. Wherever you are. <laughs> Wherever you are. I don't know yeah. what's going on, what you're doing in your life, but I want you to know that you're loved. We see you, sis. Yeah. We see you, brother. You know, there's a lot of men going through a lot of this stuff and this is hard mm-hmm. too. Um, don't forget you're not alone. You guys, until next time, I want to thank you so much for joining us here on Strength and Love. But before we go, Elizabeth, if people want to contact you and connect with you, where can they go to find you? Yeah, so you can connect with our foundation at rosemaryfoundation.com. Um, Rosemary is the flower that symbolizes remembrance. And so I cho- we chose to um, start this foundation support, uh, in providing doula care in remembrance of our babies. So rosemaryfoundation.com, you can find um, our foundation there. You can also find us on Facebook, uh, the Rosemary Foundation for Maternal Care. You can find me through that as well. So if you message or email us at the foundation, you're going to find me. So reach out. We'd love to connect with any of you. Thank you so much, you guys. Thank Thank you you so much, Elizabeth. You're amazing. Thank you, guys. Until next time, sending you strength and love. This is Stephanie Courtney. See you soon.